our second speaker this evening is Gideon Falter. Gideon. Well, Melanie, we've got some examples of, of exactly what you've seen. Um, we've seen on social media people from the far left and the far right and Islamists all agreeing with each other that they hate Jews. The only thing they can't agree on is why. The proper reason for hating Jews is what they disagree on. But, ladies and gentlemen, what we've just seen in this documentary is a graphic lesson in what happens when a civilization, when a society, fails to enforce its own laws. I'm reminded this week in the Torah is a reading which contains three important words which contain the entire basis of Western civilization. Tzedek, tzedek, tirdof. Justice, justice, you shall pursue. And those simple words were radical in their time. Power was exerted through the sword, and through wealth, and the idea that justice should be the ultimate goal of every person and the worthiest form of power was bold and it was new. And it goes to the essence of what civilization is. We cannot thrive, we cannot consider ourselves civilized without justice. The documentary we just watched started with a question, how far will Europe tolerate intolerance? In other words, will Europe pursue justice? Will it enforce justice? Well, the events answer that question. Law enforcement against extremists cannot wax and wane. If you let hate thrive for decades and decades, then you eventually pass a point of no return. The terrorist attacks we're witnessing around Europe were born in a vacuum. They were born in a vacuum of enforcement, where extremism was tolerated with minimal disruption by acquiescent liberal states fearful of causing upset. We talk so much about immigration into Europe that we sometimes forget to look at who is leaving, and the Jews are leaving. Thankfully, there is no global database tracking Jewish migration, but Israel does count the number of people availing themselves of the law of return, which guarantees Jews unconditional safe haven. Since 2000, 6% of the Jewish population of Europe has emigrated to Israel. In 2014, the rate of Jewish emigration doubled, and its highest ever level was in 2015. It continues to rise. Leaving your home is not a snap decision. And for it to have sped up to this degree shows that it has momentum. For many of those who emigrate, it will have been a decision that was 10 years in the making. And in addition to that 6% that we know about which have, who have emigrated to Israel, there are the uncounted many who have come to the United Kingdom and the United States. In the video, Alan Dershowitz asked his illuminating question, had the only terrorist murders been in Paris, uh, sorry, in Paris last January, been the four Jews in, their, uh, in the kosher supermarket, would there have been a million people demonstrating in the street? <coughs> well, we know from the shooting in the Jewish Museum in Brussels and the shooting of the Jewish children in Toulouse and countless others that that is not what happens. You don't get a million people on the street when it's just the Jews. And as Melanie said, after the November attacks, people started to say, now everybody's a target. They were already a target. When Jews start leaving, it is the surest possible sign that a society is starting to collapse. But Jews are not just leaving because of the major terrorist attacks that grab the headlines. They're leaving because of stories like that of a couple I want to talk to you about, Samuel and Diana Blogg, both in their late 80s, both Holocaust survivors, both independent, living in Amsterdam. One night, two men walked past their door, noticed the Jewish mezuzah, knocked on the door pretending to be police officers, and when they barged their way in, shouting, dirty Jews, they, bun they punched Samuel until he was blind. They broke Samuel and Diana's bones until they were bound to a wheelchair for life and left thinking that they were dead. And there is only one way to look at this, you may have heard or read of uh, Joseph Heller's book, Catch-22. And in this book, as the war rages, the protagonist, an airman called Caesarian, exclaims, they're trying to kill me. To which his comrade answers, they're trying to kill everyone. And Caesarian replies, well, what difference does that make? They're trying to kill me, they're trying to kill the people that I love, and they're trying to kill all of you too. So what can we in Britain learn from what's happening in Europe? We could comfort ourselves. We could use Jews as a gauge of our society's health, and our country is one of the best places in the world in which to be Jewish. We're offering a haven to the afflicted. Some London synagogues are holding their, their services in French. 
but beware of such conclusions. Four years ago, two British Islamists, Sajid and Sashda Khan, were taught by to caught by total fluke. They'd been building bombs in their front room and planned to attack the Jewish community. Only they had an argument, the neighbours overheard, the police were called, and that is why there has not been this terrorist bombing in the last couple of years against Jews in Britain. That's how close we came. As we approach the High Holy Days, once again, synagogue goers will pass airport-style security that has been the norm in this country for decades. But in 2014, when anti-Semitic attacks here broke all records during the Gaza war, people tried to explain it away as some kind of rage against Israel. But then explain to me where that anti-Semitism came from. Why the following year, when my charity conducted its national anti-Semitic crime audit, did we find that without the convenient excuse of a war in Gaza, anti-Semitic crime jumped 26%, violence against Jews surged 51% in a year with no ostensible trigger. I'll tell you why. Because at the same time as anti-Semitic crime was breaking new records, the charging of anti-Semitic crime dropped. The Crown Prosecution Service proudly announced just recently that it prosecuted more hate crime than ever before last year, 15,000 cases. But the number of anti-Semitic hate crime cases that they prosecuted was just 12. 12 cases in an entire year when it broke all records. Now we have one of the strongest legislative frameworks in Europe for fighting hate crime and extremism, but we are not using it effectively. For all the talk about cracking down on hate crime following Brexit, we've seen no evidence, no evidence of any meaningful action against resurgent far-right groups the anti-Semitic extreme left has taken over the Labour Party and it's taken us now 20 years for us to finally silence the Islamist preacher Anjem Chowdhury. Now we have the political will in this country to enforce the law against anti-Semites and extremists, but the breakdown occurs in police forces and the Crown Prosecution Service. Anti-Semitism is rarely a hot topic for long. It's in competition with everything from domestic violence to benefits fraud and anti-Semitism is often left to fester, and that is exactly how it thrives. The consequence is that we're treating the cancer of growing extremism only when it is already strong and at its most violent. We're not ripping it out by its roots. My charity, Campaign Against Anti-Semitism, is working to change that. We've earned the support of the Prime Minister and her team precisely because we hold the authorities' feet to the fire, even taking them to court when necessary. The time has passed for quiet pleading, this is the fight for our country, and we cannot lose that fight. The words now are as relevant as they ever were. Justice, justice, you shall pursue. We've had a very bleak picture because we have a very bleak situation. But there is work that we can do. We have, to have, we, we have to win this fight. If we lose, the, the, the future that we saw on that video is no future. How can you have a future where the only safe place for Jews to live in the world is Israel? And sometimes that's not so safe it's, uh, either. We cannot lose this. And the one thing that gives me hope is look where we're sitting right now, in this beautiful room in the Mother of Parliaments. This is Britain. When Europe last burned, we stood firm, we did things differently, we stood firm, we stood up for our values, and when it came to it, we came together. This is World War III. Many people don't seem to have realised that because it's a slow-burning World War III, but it is burning and the fire is approaching. And when that happens, my, the one thing that gives me hope is that this country will realise the situation that it's in and do as it has done before and stand firm.